Today, I'm very glad to introduce Professor Kara Byrne, uh, who is a lecturer in the Department of English, is also a faculty associate in the Schubert Center for Child Studies, is homegrown, if you will, got her degree, several of her degrees here at Case Western Reserve, and is going to be talking about something very dear to my heart, which is children's literature, and particularly children's books, and modern science and the things that we think about when these things are created. And you can see the title of her talk is C is for Coronavirus, P is for Pandemic, COVID-19 in Children's Picture Books. Professor Byrne. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here today in person and remotely. I'm so grateful for those watching the comfort of your office, home, or wherever you may be, and for those joining here. Um, before I begin the presentation, I would like to thank and acknowledge several important people. First and foremost, to the Baker Nord Center, to Maggie, to Daniel, to Brian. Thank you so much for your support of my research, which spans many years and has led to many publications and partnerships, so thank you. I would also like to thank the wonderful faculty and staff at the Schubert Center for Child Studies and the Schubert Center Fellows Eduardo Williams Medina and Hanin Abdel Nabi, who um, will be working with me this semester. Uh, I would also like to thank my SAGES and English department students and colleagues, especially Chris Kelly, who's given me an amazing amount of feedback at different stages of this project. Um, and finally, to my co-investigator of this larger project, Dr. Kristen Kondralik of Westchester University in Pennsylvania. So, today's presentation will focus on the emergence of children's picture books about COVID-19 and exploring the ways in which authors and illustrators of children's literature responded to the pandemic, I, aid, I aim to provide a thorough overview and analysis of the subgenre. And while I will spotlight several of the hundreds of picture books published over the last two years about COVID-19, the central goal of this presentation is not to advocate for teaching or sharing these books with children. Instead, I argue that these recent works tell us a lot about how we conceptualize and understand children's roles during the pandemic. So I've divided this talk into four sections. First, I'll talk about the origins of the project and my personal as well as professional connection to the books. Second, I will analyze free COVID-19 eBooks, explaining where one can find over 400 children's books about the pandemic and detail the findings of a coding project that analyzes a sample of them. Third, I will discuss more recent pandemic themed print picture books, some of which are in the corner, if you'd like to take a look after the presentation. And finally, I will end this presentation explaining what these picture books can teach us about the genre of children's picture books, adult perceptions of children, and ourselves. So, I first want to take us back to a time that many of us vividly remember and might want to forget. It was a little more than two years ago when the news of a coronavirus began to emerge and affect all of our lives. Personally, in March of 2020, I was wrapping up an accelerated 10-week spring semester and caring for my two and five-year-olds while nine months pregnant. <laughs> uh, my five-year-old started coming home from kindergarten asking, what is a colona? Um, what's a virus? Where is China? How many people are getting sick? Are you sick? Is the virus going to make me die? She started asking these questions when she heard murmurs of new terms and strange concepts at her elementary school and at home. She wanted definitions of terms like COVID-19, corona, lethal, and quarantine. Each time, I would try to provide an honest and simple answer. A coronavirus is something that you can't see that can make people sick. And we don't know anyone who has a coronavirus called COVID-19 right now, and we're going to keep washing our hands to stay well. At the start, I would try to respond in a way that wouldn't upset her, but would simultaneously give her a concrete answer. But by mid-March, things were getting more challenging. Students at CWRU and many universities were told not to come back to campus after spring break, and my bi-weekly hospital visits were getting more and more intense. My days were often a strange balance of going to a somber and anxiety-filled hospital, checking on how close to labor I was, with staying in my home, a place that everyone expressed was the safest place for my family and me to be. 
When my daughter's schools closed and the stay-at-home order went into effect, all was even more intensified. I joined many in trying to balance my work responsibilities with researching emerging information about COVID-19, weighing the risks and responsibilities with, res uh, with uh, risks and benefits of everything from grocery shopping to keeping doctor's appointments. I also needed to figure out a way to comfort my children who were already excited and nervous about a new sibling coming and wondered why they couldn't see their grandmothers or play with their neighbors. As a children's literature scholar and a mother of little ones, I went to a resource that I often turned to to examine complex topics, children's picture books. In the beginning of the stay-at-home orders, my children and I read a range of picture books, some with stories about grief, others with moments of ordinary magic, and some that were simply their favorite stories to read. Children's literature helped us share a moment together and open up conversation about their disappointment of canceled events and their concern about the stressed adults around them. Though more common for us and many parents, we're not picking up a print book, but rather turning to our computers, phones, and tablets. Prior to the pandemic, parents were told to monitor their children's screen time carefully and even keep toddlers off screens altogether. Now, children like my kindergartner needed to complete classwork through online portals, and the only way they could see extended family was through video conferencing. As more and more children were asked to use computers to learn, many children's book authors and illustrators and famous figures tried to contribute to these educational resources and began to offer virtual read-alouds. Dolly Parton, the self-described book lady and founder of the Imagination Library nonprofit, which provides picture books to children birth to age five throughout the country and now globally, started to read books from her bed in her pajamas, from The Little Engine That Could to Last Stop on Market Street, as part of her Good Night with Dolly series that lasted from April to June of 2020. Similarly, in partnership with PBS Kids, Michelle Obama offered a five-week series called Mondays with Michelle, where she, and sometimes a special guest, like President Obama, read a picture book or two, like The Gruffalo or The Very Hungry Caterpillar, via Facebook and YouTube. Well-known authors like Grace Lynn and Oliver Jeffers, just to name a few, read from their best-known children's books and engaged with readers through Facebook Live. These read-alouds were meant to encourage children as their days had changed, giving them a story to listen to and sometimes an activity to complete. Instead of reading from one of his famous books, Elephant and Piggy author and illustrator Mo Willems offered daily lunch doodle classes. On March 16th, as part of his residency at the Kennedy Center Education Office, Willems announced that since so many of his readers were at home, and he was too, he would begin teaching drawing courses at 1 p.m. each afternoon, stating there's nothing more fun than doodling with a friend. Over the course of several weeks and 15 classes, Willems helped teach viewers how to draw some of his classic characters, like a pigeon who wants to drive a bus and Nuffle Bunny, and told them how creative and imaginative they are. His course emphasized togetherness through art, attempting to create a sense of in-personness through pre-recorded YouTube videos. On April 3rd, he wore a graduation cap and gown and declared an end to the series because his viewers had become MMDs, or Mo Master Doodlers. He differentiated his young viewers from MDs, the doctors whom he described as heroes, because these are the people who are working very, very hard to save people and make people feel better. But he explained to his viewers, you are doing your part by being home, being creative, and being wonderful. As sweet and initially popular as these initiatives were, they were also short-lived. The final screen of Willem's last episode appeared the phrases, thank you for watching and making, share your skills, make art with friends, these last couple of sentences left my daughters at a loss as they still could not see or easily communicate with their friends. And even as Willems came back with a couple more episodes in May for Thank You Thursdays, in which he encouraged children to make thank you cards for medical workers, scientists, and teachers, 
this too only lasted a very short time. Very few of these series continued past June of 2020. Parton, Obama, Willems did not acknowledge or speak to growing concerns and the extended timeline of the pandemic, instead focusing on the very temporary nature of staying home. The same day that my son was born, on March 26, 2020, the United States became the worldwide leader in the number of positive COVID-19 cases. His birth marked a time of joy for my small family and a time of overwhelming fear and anxiety of contagion and unknowns about the virus. Millions had lost their jobs, the death rate due to COVID climbed, and hospitals began to fill. While at home with my three kids, I appreciated the temporary entertainment that the weekly drawing classes and read-alouds provided, but these videos did not help me address their growing anxieties and questions about when would this all be over. I looked to my daughter's teachers, pediatricians, family, and friends to help me with the answers that I needed. And this is where I found a new way that children's literature was responding to the pandemic, COVID-19 themed picture books. So in this next section, I am going to move to an analysis of the hundreds of free eBooks that were written for children in response to the pandemic. Even before my son's birth in late March, I started seeing and reading examples of this new subgenre of picture books. Like other self-published or free eBooks, these books were written and published by individuals or organizations who wanted to share their messages about the pandemic quickly. Unlike the doubt that I was feeling, these books presented clear and confident messages about different aspects of the pandemic. They were also written and distributed by some of the primary sources of information that I was going to, including physicians, teachers, other caregivers, and disease specialists. When I started noticing the surge of these COVID-19 books and their peculiarities, I quickly started saving them. I also tried reading some of them to my kids, but the books were often overwhelming, confusing, or simply boring to them. They preferred to go back to the familiar classics and more colorful, engaging stories in our home library. But despite their hesitation, I was still interested in the books, and I was not alone. Patricia Sarles of the New York City School Public Library System began to curate a list of these free online children's books, providing links to the PDFs, videos, or web pages where one could access them. They began this project in April 2020, and as of January 2022, she has collected links to well over 400 titles from countries all over the world. I argue that these books are part of what Heather Hauser calls the COVID-19 infowhelm, which she describes as the phenomenon of being overwhelmed by the constant flow of sometimes conflicting information. Instead of having a couple of meticulously and thoughtfully produced children's books about the pandemic to read, caregivers were faced with hundreds, all with slightly different messages, but many with striking similarities. Ignoring the constant information about COVID-19 has not been an option for any of us during the pandemic. And the creators of these books try to use the genre of children's literature to make sense and represent emerging information to children. So I wanted to analyze the books using my knowledge and scholarship of children's picture book studies. And in collaboration with Dr. Kristen Kondralik, a medical rhetoric scholar, and Eduardo Williams Medina, a pre-med undergraduate student here at Case, we worked together to develop a form to code the eBooks in Sarl's collection, looking for trends in terms of themes, the way expertise is expressed, and what is being asked of children in these books. We also made sure to save and catalog the books as they tend to be removed from websites as quickly as they are added. And while we are still in the process of analyzing the data, we have coded over 152 eBooks about the pandemic. And a preliminary overview of our findings reinforced some of our initial assumptions while also pointing to some surprising information. One of the first questions that we had was, who were writing these books? After coding, we found that over one third were authored by someone in the medical or healthcare field, whether nurses, physicians, or medical students. Dr. Christine Borst's What is Coronavirus? defines the what the virus is, how it makes people sick, and even claims that 
the good news? You don't need to worry about this. It is the job of grown-ups in your life to take care of you, and they are doing everything they can to keep you and your family safe. Similarly, physicians Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton and Leanne Webb tell the story of Parker learning different ways to stay safe, healthy, and optimistic while staying at home. In most of these books, parents explain to the child that washing their hands, making cards for neighbors, and knowing that we're going to be okay will help them get through this time. In addition to authorship, we also wondered what were the most popular themes and ideas emphasized to children. Out of 152 books, 85 of them show mask wearing. Whether teaching children how to wear one, encouraging them to decorate their own mask, or even explaining how a mask will keep them and others safe, masks are central in these books. Similarly, 102 emphasize staying at home, encouraging children to see their home as a safe place for them and their family members and as their new school. Many of these titles recognize that children have a number of questions about why they have to stay home, like, why can't I go to school? Or, what's next? And these books attempt to give concrete and hopeful answers to these concerns. As a number of these books were created at the beginning of the pandemic, these themes make sense. Though the ways in which staying home is addressed and the kind of homes shown, often middle-class homes and neighborhoods where children have access to large outdoor spaces to play in, point to a narrow and privileged vision of what children have access to. Not surprisingly, many of the books explain or engage with what the coronavirus is specifically, whether defining it, to explaining where it came from, or how to stay away from it. 97 of the books, or 64%, reference the virus, and 51 of these books show the coronavirus with human-like features. Some of these depictions feature a bumbling coronavirus who didn't mean to travel and hurt humans, like in A Message from Corona, though most of the books that present the virus explain it in very negative terms. The virus is not just a non-living entity that can enter the body. Instead, it is malicious and wants to hurt humans, like in Julie and the Evil Queen, or is a villain that children should fear and attempt to destroy through hand washing and mask wearing, like in How to Defeat the Icky, Filthy, Creepy, Slimy, Corona Monster. Of all of the lessons a pandemic-themed book could teach, we found that many of them visually present the microscopic virus structure. As over half of the books turn the virus into a character, a being who speaks, walks, and has motivation, this points to a desire to give the pandemic a specific antagonist, teaching children to view the virus itself that is something that's out to get them and their family. While the books that emphasize mask wearing and staying at home often focus on a passive individual sacrifice for the common good, the books that center the virus often tell children that they must fight against this monster actively and thoughtfully. And as you can probably tell from the examples that I've shown, these books vary greatly in terms of illustrative style and appeal, with some using clip art and others being illustrated by professional artists. 109 of the books we coded use a cartoonish style, whether hand-drawn with pen or pencil or generated through a computer program. The repetitive use of clip art and non-realistic images is strange and sometimes a distracting element to the very wordy scientific information offered on each page. However, this apparent contradiction may be purposeful. Children's librarian and critic K.T. Horning states that cartoon art is frequently used to lighten a heavy subject and to put a comfortable distance between the child reader and a potentially disturbing theme. In using bold lines and exaggerated and sometimes absurd figures, authors and illustrators have the opportunity to add lightness and fun to a difficult topic. Though what is complicated about this addition of levity is that the message that so many of these books emphasize is that ending the pandemic is dependent upon a child's ability to stay home, stay apart, and stay well, and that the pandemic will all be over and life will return to the way it was prior. So while we're still studying these preliminary findings, 
I wanted to pick out a couple of the books in particular that have been the most cited or celebrated in this genre and reflect a number of these prevalent themes. In the spring of 2020, Candlewick Press published a short ebook comic of one of their most popular characters, The Princess in Black. My daughters love the Princess Magnolia and her monster fighting alter ego, The Princess in Black, always looking forward to the next book in the series. While readers are used to the princess attending science fairs, holding play dates, and solving monster related problems in 70 page stories, in the spring of 2020, they were introduced to an eight-page booklet titled The Princess in Black and the Case of the Coronavirus. In this brief guide, they were told by a beloved character that she was facing a problem she couldn't solve by herself, a germ so tiny that she can't see it, but we can fight it in three steps. First, wash your hands or paws or hooves. Second, stay home and cancel all play dates until the germ is defeated. And finally, make some space or stay approximately one frimple pants the horse, or six feet, um, away from people who don't live with you. Author Shannon Hale explained that she and illustrator Leung Pham hoped that by seeing a familiar book friend would be a comfort to young children struggling with anxiety and distancing, and that this guide would be an extra tool for caregivers. Like Willems and Obama, The Princess in Black also told children that in working together, we can solve this problem. While this booklet is concise and direct, one of the earliest and most promoted eBooks about COVID-19 provides a much more, more thorough explanation of the virus. In Coronavirus, a book for children, was published in April 2020 and co-written by three children's book editors in consultation with a professor of infectious disease modeling and in, illustrated by Axel Scheffler, a well-known children's illustrator of the Gruffalo. By answering questions like, what is the coronavirus? And why are people worried about catching the coronavirus? The authors balance what was known about COVID-19 at the time with statements about what is still unclear. And emphasizing that COVID-19 largely affected elderly populations and that hand washing could help alleviate some risk, the books ask children to take on an active role to help their parents and keep themselves and their communities well. In Coronavirus, a book for children, COVID-19 is not a friend or an enemy, but rather a fleeting dimension of the children's lives that is serious and present now, but will one day disappear. In the last section of the book, which attempts to answer the question, what is going to happen next? The authors explain that scientists and doctors need time to study and treat people with COVID-19, but that one day, quite soon, though nobody knows exactly when, you'll be able to visit people you love who don't live with you, play with your friends, go to school again, and do lots of other things that you enjoy but can't do now. The accompanying illustrations show this hopeful moment when children emerge from their home, re-enter the world they were accustomed to, hug their grandparents, and celebrate the fact that, quote, we did this together. Thinking back to early April 2020, when this book was first published, there seemed to be a sense of a more immediate stopping point and a great sense of togetherness and community, even while apart. The authors created a vision of a day when the vaccine would be offered, antibody tests would be widely available, and the spread of the virus would slow down. While a number of these early books were meant to share very hopeful messages, quite a few also served as public health documents shared by organizations. Nonprofits, institutes, and global agencies, including the United Nations Interagency Standing Committee, the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and the U.S. Department of Education, shared their own COVID-19 related books for children. And in the spring of 2020, the Emory Global Health Institute at Emory University held a children's ebook competition, asking adult writers and illustrators to create picture books for children ages six to nine that include age-appropriate factual information on COVID-19, reassure the reader that they are safe and it's okay to feel upset, and describe actions taken by medical professionals and others. This contact test attracted 260 entries and was judged by 70 professionals with backgrounds in medicine, public health, education, publishing, and the arts. The winning picture book was Beth Bacon and Carrie Lee's 
COVID-19 helpers, which met the criteria of the contest by explaining that COVID-19 is spread by tiny droplets in the air and celebrating the contribution that researchers, healthcare workers, and leaders made to mitigate the spread. But the central helper described is the child, who the authors say no longer attends school, movie theaters, or birthday parties, but was doing something very important. Many of these books emphasize hand washing, explain what the virus is, and encourage children to be brave and to do their part in stopping the spread of the coronavirus. Children are celebrated and called heroic for, and helpful for staying put, as if they had the choice and agency to do it. Looking at my own children and thinking about the decisions that I, as their caregiver, were making for them, in addition to the changes instituted by their school district, city, and state, I'm often struck by the rosy and impossible vision of childhood that many of these books present, along with their quick and concise definitions of coronavirus and PPE. One of the struggles that many of the authors and illustrators of the first wave of these picture books faced was trying to get information out as quickly as possible. This led to a number of picture book conventions being foregone, including a robust peer review, editors critiquing and making changes, and a more typical release schedule. The effect of these missing elements is often clear in one's reading experience and also helps explain why the creation of these ebooks has slowed down considerably since the start of the pandemic. While most of these books were published in the spring and summer of 2020, more writers and illustrators are creating books for profit and on a slower timeline now. In fact, the last update to the New York website was November 2021, which offers us a concrete window for analyzing these free eBooks and help us understand what doctors, parents, and teachers expected of children during the first two years of the pandemic. So in the next part of this presentation, I want to shift my focus from these free eBooks written by concerned medical professionals, parents, and teachers, and published for free online to the print books that are published in a more traditional way and for a cost. While the free eBooks that I just discussed were more, tend to be more quickly produced and meant to disseminate complex information to overwhelm caregivers and children now, many of the hundreds of print books published over the last two years have gone through a more thorough editorial process and used conventional styles, length, and storytelling modes in order to deliver information about the pandemic. And while Kristen, Eduardo, and I have developed a rigorous system for coding the free eBooks, we are also interested in these books that are available for a cost and in print form. We have collected and cataloged 120 of these pandemic themed print books, though for the sake of time, I'm just gonna focus on a couple of books that represent reoccurring themes and tropes. Unlike many of the eBooks, the print books are largely written and illustrated by people who have previously published picture books on non-COVID topics. First, there are a number of non-fiction books about the pandemic. These readers are often labeled for a specific reading level, pre-K to high school, and often the same author publishes five to 10 books in a series. For instance, Abdo Press offers books in their Battling COVID series, like Invisible Invasion, the COVID-19 pandemic begins, which outlines the pandemic's origin in China and covers everything from antibody tests to supply shortages of toilet paper. And in Living Apart Together, American Life During COVID-19, it describes the emergence of Zoom and live streamed events. These books frequently include glossaries, discussion questions, and quizzes. These informational nonfiction books tend to pay more attention to the age of their audience than the free eBooks, but many similarly focus on the virus, staying at home, and mask wearing. However, distinct from these books are more traditional picture books. Instead of chapters and response sections, these picture books find artistic ways to represent the pandemic and emphasize storytelling as a way to get through this time. Many gesture toward COVID-19 without ever saying the words COVID, coronavirus, virus, or pandemic. Unlike the eBooks, which turn the viruses into characters, many of these print picture books focus on emotion and the lifestyle changes that children experience during the pandemic. For instance, 
In Outside Inside, which was published during the fall of 2020, Caldecott Award honoree Leung Pham offers a more imaginative take on social distancing. Pham, who is also the illustrator of the Princess in Black series, presents a book that explores children's complex relationship with suddenly being asked to stay inside and distancing themselves from others. Instead of describing stay-at-home orders and how, um, and how the virus spreads, Pham uses poetic language to explain that something strange happened on an unremarkable day just before the seasons change, before illustrating different scenes of children who went inside and waited, looking out windows at empty sidewalks and quiet streets. An inquisitive black cat appears on each page, gazing at the changing scenes, whether with a child staring at a laptop while their anxious parent is on the phone, or standing beside an elderly man as he approaches the sliding glass door of a hospital, thanking a group of nurses and physicians wearing PPE. Pham explains that while everyone just went inside, shut their door, and waited, that actually some people needed to be where they needed to be. She includes an incredible spread of illustrations of medical workers involved in a variety of activities, from treating a young child's broken arm to trying to comfort and treat patients who are intubated and in critical care. <sighs> she does not label or explain everything that is going on in the scene that she presents, but she offers her reader a glimpse into the daunting and important work that healthcare professionals have taken on during the pandemic. There is a popular metaphor in children's literature scholarship, and my students know this well, I see some of them here today, um, that help us um, understand the power of reading a wide array of stories and encourages us to read diverse books. This metaphor, developed by Rudine Sims Bishop, calls books mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. She explains that books give us mirrors, transforming the human experience and reflecting it back to us. And in that reflection, we see our own lives and experiences as part of a larger human experience. This allows reading to become a means of self-affirmation. But books can also be windows, offering views of worlds that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors, and the reader only has to walk through to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. In Outside Inside, Pham offers readers, adult and child alike, many mirrors and windows, the opportunity to see one's experience with heartache, hard work, or hope during the pandemic, as well as to glimpse someone else's. The metaphor of the window draws on us to be empathetic and to recognize those who could not stay at home. And despite the recognition of stress and hardship in this book, um, the ending of Outside Inside is hopeful. Like many other COVID-19 books, it ends with a reunion between a child and an older adult, hugging in a sunny, flower-filled space outside the home. Windows, also published in 2020, written by Patrick Guest and illustrated by Jonathan Bentley, similarly features children watching out of a window, waiting for a time when this new world feels more like the comfortable and social world they were used to. Even though children long to see others, they are comforted by waving from their home's window to mask wearing nurse working on the street and to their friends in other windows. These children put drawings of rainbows and teddy bears in their own windows to lift spirits. Uh, the book ends with a happy reunion of grandparents and children hugging in a sweet embrace, similarly emphasizing the turn from waiting at a window to reconciliation. The windows in these books don't just symbolize a book's ability to see beyond oneself, but in these COVID-themed picture books, they also show a yearning to be outdoors and for the world to return to the way it once was. But the windows also situate a child in a position where they are frozen, fixed in one spot, waiting and watching, but not truly participating or affecting change. Like the rainbow drawings hanging in the windows, the children too wait for a happier time when the pandemic is over and life returns to the way it was before the pandemic started. 
The books don't imagine children facing loss, death, or illness themselves. Instead, largely in these books, the focus is light, happy, and restorative. Rainbows are a frequent symbol in these picture books as well, stemming from early on in the pandemic when children were asked to paint rainbows and paint these drawings in their window. Several of the e-books reference this activity, encouraging children to color in a rainbow shape and hang it up in their window, or telling the story of kind children who made rainbows as a service to their communities. Though print picture books more often use the rainbow to signal the idea that the pandemic has introduced a scary and intimidating storm, but we are all waiting for a rainbow to come to show us how the world became better and more beautiful because of the trial we lived through. The rainbow can join two friends together, like in Alone Together and While We Can't Hug, or help a child work through their broad range of feelings, as represented by the colors of the rainbow, like in Love Was Inside. But often, the rainbow signifies hope and reminds us of a coming happier future. As Michelle Robinson states in her book, The World Made a Rainbow, the light couldn't shine if it never knew dark, and rainbows can't color the world without rain. As the publication of free ebooks about the pandemic has waned and the publication of print books like the titles I've just discussed has increased, children's relationship with COVID has also changed. Since the start of the pandemic, and as of February 17, 2022, 12.5 million US children have tested positive for COVID. Since September of 2021, about 8 million of these cases were reported, meaning that well over half of the children's cases have occurred in just the last five months. During this surge, children who make up 22.2% of the total US population accounted for 22.8% of new cases, with children under four accounting for almost half of these cases with an increase in hospitalization as well. We can no longer promise children that they will not get COVID, that they will stay well so long as they properly wash their hands and wear their masks, and that all will return to the way things were eventually. Though honestly, authors for children should never make promises or absolute statements about wellness anyway, no matter how hopeful we want to be. Many of the more traditional picture books about the pandemic, featuring beautiful illustrations and hopeful messages, give us an optimistic, though limited vision of what children and adults alike have lived through for the past two years. So <laughs> um, to conclude, what can we learn from these books? Throughout this presentation, I have explored early read aloud initiatives and activity books based on beloved picture book characters, e-books that promise a happy tomorrow if children are able to fight off monstrous COVID, and print books with windows and rainbows and hope. From the very beginning of the pandemic, children's literature has offered stories, creative stories and directive instructions about what we expect children to do during this time. Many of the free eBooks emphasize an antagonistic virus that children are expected to defeat by staying home, washing hands, and wearing their masks. While the print books engage with more traditional tropes and stories, emphasizing hope and restoration to the, things, the way things were. Despite analyzing hundreds of these books, I have only scratched the surface of what exists in this subgenre. So are these picture books about the pandemic good resources for children? Largely no. <laughs> Many are poorly illustrated and written more as a script for adults to read than at a level that is engaging and understandable to children. There are also a number that provide incorrect information about COVID-19, correct to what was known at the time but has since changed. So if readers are looking for specific suggestions on picture books to read with young children about the pandemic, I would recommend books written and developed by experts of child development and public health, including books in the Sesame Street series on the pandemic, almost always a big hit, <laughs> um, as well as books for slightly older readers, like What is Coronavirus COVID-19 or Understanding Coronaviruses, which provides in-depth information for older audiences to then process and share with younger children. I would also recommend books like Outside Inside or Brian Flacka's Keeping the City Going, as both have a more inclusive vision of what the pandemic has been like, or 
<coughs> give readers more windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors to borrow from Sims Bishop's framework. However, I would actually be quicker to recommend other picture books to read during this time, including some of the very first books that I picked up at the start of the pandemic. These picture books emphasize story instead of information, with messages of embracing change, experiencing anxiety and grief, and finding new ways to connect to others. They provide a space for readers to ask questions and to make sense of this challenge, challenging and intimidating time. So if I would recommend very few of these books, why have I spent the last two years dedicating my research to them? Why catalog, analyze, and read these picture books at all, especially as the pandemic continues? Well, beyond the fact that there are useful and even profound picture books that can speak to, the, to readers about the pandemic on this list, I argue that they are more important to view as historical documents that provide a significant record of adults' thoughts about the virus, of medical professionals, and most importantly, about children themselves. As Perry Nodelman argues in his seminal book, The Hidden Adult Defining Children's Literature, through children's picture books, adults offer children images of childhood that they expect children to mimic in order to be the right kind of children. Picture books, which are rarely created by children and instead written, designed, purchased, and read by adults, often feature children learning didactic lessons and end with a happy vision of possible futures. Some children will easily be able to see themselves in the books they read and follow the instructions provided, but others will struggle to do so. The expectation that children can mimic the behavior shown in many of these pandemic-themed picture books, which include staying at home, being well, and having loved ones who have survived the pandemic, is not only impossible for some children, it also ignores the trauma and the challenges that children have faced during the last two years. Nodelman continues, Childhood, as most often understood and is most often depicted in texts of children's literature, is a fabrication and a fantasy. These books may attempt to give us all hope, but they inscribe a specific vision of what childhood is, which rarely presents children who are already marginalized. On January 4th, 2022, the New York Times started the new year with a harrowing message. American children are starting 2022 in crisis. Stemming from the October 2021 declaration from the American Academy of Pediatrics, who emphasized a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health, citing the enormous adversity and disruption, increased rates of suicide attempts, and the more than 140,000 children who lost a primary or secondary caregiver to COVID-19. They noted that they are seeing record rates of children who need medical attention, including children being diagnosed with COVID themselves. And several weeks ago, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy spoke to the Senate Finance Committee about the devastating impact the pandemic has had on children's mental health, stating that our obligation to act is not just medical, it's moral. It's not only about saving lives, it's about listening to our kids who are concerned about the state of the world that they are set to inherit. So rarely do COVID-19 picture books acknowledge that the pandemic is transformative for youth and not always in a happy way. There is a place for hope and positivity, but there's no going back to the way things were before or believing that all kids won't be affected by COVID-19. While children's picture books can serve as wonderful and artistic modes to share stories and information with young people, we also need to acknowledge that in many cases, they show us what kind of childhood we hope that children have during and after the pandemic. But this vision is sorely limited and it's largely a fabrication and a fantasy. Thank you. I think we have about 10 minutes. Yeah, we have time for questions. Um, I might start. Yes, Because I'm <laughs> holding the mic. Um, am I right in that there has not been, so if in the modern, in the history of the modern children's book, there has never been a single event or theme that has so unified an industry as this one. 
great question. And this is actually, I think, surprising to a lot of people. The children's picture books, like the one that we're so familiar with, that win Caldecott Awards, that are really geared towards um, our early and even like pre-readers, is, is a relatively new phenomenon. And especially in the number and volume of children's picture books that are published each year. I mean, just in the United States alone, 3,000 plus pieces of children's literature are published. Um, and so we just have an enormous volume in, in ways that, you know, if we think back to previous pandemics, we didn't have. And so one, one possible avenue of research that um, Dr. Kondralik and I are specifically interested in, she is a, a medical rhetorician who, who looks at um, how medical professionals spoke to patients in the 19th century. So she's really interested in that history, is thinking about how have, has, has there been children's literature that has responded to? And in a preliminary search, not really, or at least not in this way. And this is also where thinking about the ebook or thinking about a quickly created and distributed online for no cost resource that someone can easily access through phone, tablet, and computer. This is really the first time that we're seeing such a variety of books very quickly produced in that mode as well. And so I think this is kind of a, an interesting test case for like what might happen. Um, you know, as we think about not just a pandemic, but also other large world events that are happening, how do we explain it to children and do we use children's picture books as an avenue to explain that? Or maybe is it, is it not the best genre for that? I might get in trouble for saying this, but you can think about the almost, you suggested this, the almost ephemeral nature, especially the e-books, and think of them yeah. similar to broadsides, popular song, there's yeah. all kinds of parallels, but specifically targeted at children. Yeah, yeah. so. Oh, um, we talk more about Yeah, that. we can talk about that. Uh, <laughs> questions, uh, I'll hand you the mic if you have a question, so, so people listening can hear. Any? Oh, yeah, Brian. Thank you, Kara, that was a really interesting talk. Um, my question is whether there were any anomalies. You said there weren't many books you could recommend. Um, and I'll, I'll give you one example of something I would have expected to find in this literature. So within the university, super privileged, vaccinated, masked. And in fact, most of the people I got to Zoom with those first few weeks looked gorgeous. And their, their, their background was great. Their houses looked clean. And one of the most striking things as a parent was that my kids were seeing things that weren't talked about in school. Yes nudity and profanity and yeah. um, just, you know, and sometimes there were things going on in our house that I hoped their teacher and their classmates didn't see. Yeah. Um, so for example, did any of the books engage with the things kids were actually seeing as they were doing remote schooling? The short answer to that is not really. And that's what made, again, like thinking about the strangeness of these books. And I, and, you know, I'm speaking of this, looking at my own kids, but like, just how limited the visions were. If it did show Zoom, it's just you know a couple of boxes of kids, but then the child just went back to the window <laughs> to look outside. It doesn't necessarily take on the harder issues. There's also only one or two that take on food insecurity, which we know millions of children struggled with food, millions of people, and children specifically, struggled with food insecurity during this pandemic, and we found one. Abuse is also something that's really not touched upon, so that's also where it's, it's this very specific vision of childhood that omits, like what you were saying, a lot of the experiences that children had during the pandemic, which I think is really complicated because if we do go back to these books and we see them as, well, this is what it was like for kids during the pandemic, we've left out so many stories. Um, another just like anomaly that's a little bit different is we were really interested that very few of these books um, talk about the vaccine after it became available. So vaccines are mentioned, especially in earlier works, as this is what's going to end the pandemic. Once we have, the scientists have done their work, once we have a vaccine, we're closer to everything going back to normal. But then the vaccines came out, and, and we're still at a place where children under five cannot be vaccinated. But children five and up can, and very few of the books offer a vaccination story. Um, actually, Carrie Lee, who is the author of the Emory winning book, does have like a, a vaccination theme book that she came out with as like the, the next one in the series. 
but compared to mask wearing and hand washing, where we can find hundreds, like lots of books that show that very, very few of them engage with vaccination. Can you say a little uh, bit more about what would have been valuable uh, to make the books more accurate or honest? I mean, you know, yeah. I, as a parent of three, my whole, my children's entire lives are based on lies. You know, I've constructed like <laughs> a kind of framework oh. of fantasy yeah. that is like used to, you know, safely get them through to adulthood. Yes. And, but it sounds like in this context, you think that there's something off about that. I mean, this is also where we think about COVID misinformation, which is something that is significant for us to think about. And I think in these picture books, it gets disguised much more readily than like when we open social media and we see something that you know, distorts or provides you know, false information. And this too is where we can think about what should picture books do? Um, I, I think that you know, one of the reasons why I don't emphasize or encourage these necessarily, with the exception of some of the books, so going back to the slide, that do provide kind of a reader-friendly information. Like, because for some readers, having like being able to see a microscopic vision, like um, illustration of a coronavirus could be really comforting and useful. So I don't want to discredit the fact that there are picture books that provide scientific information or, or you know, specific orientation towards the pandemic that could be useful. However, I think that a lot of them aren't as useful because they, they just don't really represent what kids are, are thinking about or questioning. And that's where, again, I think looking at books that think about emotional responses. Like right now, we're focusing a lot on mental health in children because we are seeing a crisis there. So books like The Rabbit Listen talk about you know, what people sometimes talk as like big feelings in kids or grief. So having books that talk about loss. One of the amazing assumptions that so many of these books about COVID make is that no one you love is going to die. Like all of this is gonna go back to normal and you, the child, aren't gonna get sick. So many of the books early on promise that. And again, 12.5 million children who've tested positive for COVID and children have gotten sick and died. Like that's you know, something we know too. So here, yeah. oh, sorry, yes. So I know you're, you're talking about uh, like how these books are maybe not the best ways to receive information. So with the increase in like, uh, resources like like videos and like uh, yeah. uh, um, like news articles. What do you think is the most effective way oh, to? Oh, Alvin, that's a great question. <laughs> and this is where too. I mean, so I think caregivers have to assess, you know, what's what's best for their kid and, and listening to their kids too. Because I think often like we think of that as a responsibility to like figure out the best resources. But as I mentioned to Chris, like that'll look different for different kids. You know, again, some kids will be really um, profoundly moved by getting a lot of scientific information about COVID, whereas others, you know, will do better to think about like a more imaginative story that, that helps them process big feelings or change. Like the idea that we, we don't know what's going to happen the next day, that's daunting. And that's really hard as a parent to try to explain to your child as well. Um, so there are a number of incredible resources. You know, again, for this presentation, I focus more on books just because that's what I've been studying. Um, but there's, I wish I could also say, so like the CDC has not given or issued a children's book about COVID. They're actually one of like the few larger organizations that hasn't done that. Um, and so I can't necessarily name or recommend sources from, from other maybe well-known sources. Um, but I would, again, just point back to these. And, and I think another iteration of the project is thinking more like, are there animated shorts that talk to children about COVID-19 or you know, other forms of media that could also, that could maybe be better at doing this than picture books? I think that's a great way to end. Yes. Thank Professor Byrne again for a thank great you. talk. 
Thank you all so much. And thank you for the home. Thank you.